archive and we can go ahead and uh, <clears throat> start to take a look now at module five, right? That's where we left off. Okay, and what we're going to do is continue the discussion of risk management. And uh, what we're going to be focusing on here are tools that will help us manage financial risk. And we are gonna break that into two parts. Uh, the second part will deal with actually managing some sort of foreign currency risk that we might uh, face if we have international type of uh, business endeavors. So uh, as you well know, uh, if we have a risk, okay, which is the chance that there'll be some sort of loss, then we are looking for a return. And uh, that return will generally be greater if the risk is greater. So we start seeing that certain behaviors can be explained by that phenomenon and that um, we could have risk indifferent behavior, which basically says that someone will accept risk and not necessarily uh, expect a greater return for greater risk. Risk adverse behavior is, hey, if we're going to take on additional risk, then we'll be looking for a higher return. And so uh, you can see, and that's sort of human nature, but they put it in the terms of managers. Most managers are risk adverse. So why don't you go ahead and flashcard that, that that is sort of the normal set, the more risk, the more return. Now there's also risk seeking behavior and risk seeking behavior would be individuals that seek activity uh, that is riskier and they look for less return. I'm not exactly who does that, maybe somebody with some sort of chemical imbalance, but it doesn't seem to me that uh, you know, most folks would, and certainly in the business setting, would be of that sort of mindset. Now, when we look at risk exposure and talking about financial risk here, of course, we can have interest rate risk, market risk, default risk, credit risk, liquidity risk, and price risk. So we're going to go ahead and just understand some definitions here. And then we're going to understand some returns um, that we can calculate. And then when we get into module um, five, our part two of this discussion, we'll start to look at ways to manage uh, some of these risks. So we come over and interest rate risk is the risk that we will buy an instrument. It will have some sort of return, some sort of interest return, and then interest rates will change. So you buy a bond and the bond yields 5%, then what? Then interest rates as they currently are go up. Well, now that bond is not a great of, uh, uh, instrument for you anymore because it's only paying you 5% when the market is paying a higher interest rate, 6% uh, return, say, if they were to uh, change the interest rates. So when you look at this illustration, We've got this company and they go ahead and they buy a bond and they buy a $10,000 bond and they tell that they purchased it at a discount. Now, if we purchase it at a discount, that means that the market rate of interest is more than the stated coupon rate of that bond. So we bought it for a discount. And then they tell us that recently the market rate increased 1%. So we started out already with a market rate that was higher than the coupon rate. And now that trend has continued. So as a result, the market rate of the bond declined from 9,840, which is what they bought it at because they bought it at a discount. And um, if the carrying amount is this 9,048, then we have suffered uh, interest rate you know, the interest rate risk has manifested itself and we have suffered a loss there of $230 on value of that uh, bond that we purchased, that bond investment. Now, when we look at our market risk, we really can break those um, into um, whether or not we are going to be able to diversify uh, our way out of certain types of risk. Now, market risk is sometimes referred to as non-diversifiable risk. 
and that um, it is inherent with whatever's going on with the economy, what's going on with war, inflation. I mean, looking at this stuff, it almost sounds like we're talking about, you know, the news that we see on a daily basis. So when we look at market risk, okay, generally increase and decrease together, all businesses are affected by these things. Although the price, price may not increase or decrease identically, they often move in the same direction. And so we say for that reason, let me give us an example here, it is uh, very difficult to diversify out of market risk. Unsystematic firm specific risk, that is seen as diversifiable because we can invest in different companies. And if they move in different directions as certain things happen, then we can cover losses by rewards, by gains with other things that we invest in. So when you take a look, diversifiable, non-market or unsystematic or firm specific risk, those are all synonymous terms, represents the portion of the firm's industry risk that is associated with random causes and can be eliminated through diversification. Okay, so you can go ahead and you can flashcard that uh, we can diversify out of um, out of unsystematic diversifiable risk. And you come over and they give us, and I think this is a decent uh, flashcard, this pass key. Generally, I'm not in love with pass keys, but this one is pretty good and that we can classify our risk into two broad categories, those that are diversifiable and those that are non-diversifiable uh, and the other terms that are used for those, the unsystematic and the systematic risk. And they give us a mnemonic there, which I guess is pretty decent. Credit risk is the risk that uh, borrowers will not be able to uh, pay us back, okay? So exposure to credit risk includes a company's inability to secure financing or secure favorable credit terms as a result of a poor credit rating. So of course, and I think we probably have all experienced this in our personal lives as credit ratings decline, interest rate demanded by lenders or they start asking for collateral, that kind of thing. And I don't think we need to look at that example. That's pretty self-explanatory. Default risk is the risk that somebody will not be able to uh, pay us back. And we can mitigate our default risk by again, asking for collateral or looking that we will only uh, lend money to individuals with a higher credit rating, et cetera. Liquidity risk is the risk that we will not be able to quickly liquidate a particular investment, okay? And so we won't be able to wait for an orderly market if we're trying to um, get rid of a particular investment. So lenders or investors are exposed to liquidity risk when they desire to sell a security, but cannot do so in a uh, timely manner. So why don't you go ahead and flashcard that. And let's just take a look at this example because it helps us to understand that a little bit. Smithfield Company holds several fixed income securities due to current operational needs. They want to sell some of these and they are unsuccessful in attracting uh, willing buyers. And uh, as the company's working capital requirements increase, they are increasingly having to discount that bond in order to sell it. That's liquidity risk. You can't wait for an orderly market. Um, and so you suffer liquidity risk. Price risk, coming over to the next page, represents the exposure that an investor will uh, have a decline in the value of their individual securities portfolios. Factors include uh, uh, factors unique to individual investments or portfolios contribute to price risk, which becomes an even greater concern with increased market volatility. Uh, price risk is related to diversifiable and then again, if these move in different directions, you can diversify out of some of that price risk. Okay, so we understand something about the risk. Let's start to look at the return, and we're going to look at different ways to compute or contemplate um, returns. So they talk about computation of return, and there's different things 
uh, that we could do. Now, if a bond has a stated rate, an instrument, I'm saying a bond, but if an instrument has a stated rate, the stated rate is basically the rate that is printed on the bond, if bonds were printed anymore these days, that you see that right on the face. That's called the stated rate. And uh, if it says the 10% stated rate, um, all you need to do is be able to read that if it says it states a state of rate, then they say they're kind of cute here. You don't need a calculator for that. It's whatever they say the rate is. I don't think the CPA exam is going to ask you that, though, unfortunately. Now, let's take a look at effective rate. And with the effective rate, what we're going to have to do is account for any kind of fees or any kind of upfront payments we're going to have to make, and we're going to subtract that off of the total amount of borrowing, and that will allow us to calculate what the effective uh, rate of return is. So the effective interest rate represents the actual finance charges associated with borrowing after reducing loan proceeds for charges and fees related to the loan origination. And so you take a look and we have this $10,000 promissory note, 10% is the stated rate, but the bank charges a loan origination fee of $75. And um, then there's also some sort of $50 documentary uh, fee, et cetera. And so what happens when we look, we're borrowing the uh, 10,000, but we're not going to get that full 10,000 because we have to pay these fees. And then they say, well, if the interest is 10% on that 10,000, you're paying $1,000 interest, but you only got the use of $9,875. So the stated rate may be 10%, but the effective rate is uh, 13%, okay? And so the effective interest rates are computed by dividing the amount of interest paid based on the loan agreement by the net proceeds after considering these different fees. So why don't you go ahead and flashcard the way to um, compute that in case you get a question that asks you the effective rate. Now you come over and another way that we could calculate return would be annual percentage rate. And the annual percentage rate is the rate required for disclosure by federal uh, regulations. So why don't you go ahead and flashcard that point? I don't know that the exam will necessarily ask you that, but in case they say you have to calculate the required um, you know, rate by federal regulation, then you know they're asking you for the annual percentage rate. Now, with annual percentage rate, it is similar to the effective rate, but we are going to uh, annualize that for the number of periods in the year. And so you come over and you see that we have a $10,000 promissory note, and um, it displays a rate of 8% with interest to be paid semi-annually. That's twice a year, right? And the bank charges a $75 loan origination fee, and we have these documented uh, taxes. So now we're looking, and because the interest is paid semi-annually, we're going to get a different answer than what we got for that annual because there are two payment periods. And so we go ahead and we figure out the 400. Notice, guys, the denominator is exactly the same as it was for the effective interest. But now we have to sit there and say, well, we get two $400 payments every six months in a year. And so that creates this 4.05 return. And then we annualize that by multiplying it by two since it's semi-annual and there were two payments, we multiply that by two. Taking a look at the effective annual percentage rate, uh, APR, and you see that a lot um, in different uh, advertisements and whatnot. And the effective annual percentage rate represents the stated interest rate adjusted for the number of compounding periods per year. The effective annual percentage rate is abbreviated uh, APR. You don't need to flashcard that part. I think that's pretty obvious, but do flashcard 
the first part here that it is adjusted for the number of compounding periods per year. Now they give us this formula down here, guys, and I am going to ask you to flashcard that. This part of the formula should be somewhat familiar to you in that uh, this is how we calculate future value. And then if you want to get the uh, annual uh, interest, if you want to state an interest rate, then you're going to go ahead and subtract one from that. Okay, so let's just take a look at a couple things here. Let's look at the calculation. And again, I want you to uh, go ahead and flashcard that formula, but they give us the uh, a 8% uh, stated rate of interest compound semi-annually. Again, that means it's two times per year. And so we go ahead and we plug the numbers into that formula that I asked you to uh, memorize. And then you go ahead and you can come up with what that rate is by subtracting one from that. Now, I wanna show you another way, if you were on the exam and you were having trouble uh, figuring that out, you couldn't remember the formula or something, uh, then what you could do, because they do give you the uh, present value, future value tables in the uh, exam. So if you take a look at a future value table, which I'm going to post this up um, on, um, where am I? I'm going to post this up on um, e-learning a little bit later, okay? But just to show the relationship here, um, you can see that we have this uh, future value table here, and it was what? It was two periods, and you would need to go to 4%, right? Because even though it's 8%, two periods, 4% every six months. Notice you get that same answer as what was in the parentheses there in the formula, and then you just subtract one, and that would have given you uh, the answer that way as well. Okay. Um, now you come over and uh, back to the textbook. Oops, you guys don't want to talk about auditing, I don't think, today. Close that. So now my auditing book is sitting here. I don't need that today. Okay. And let's go back to uh, BEC. And let's look at simple intro, uh, simple return, excuse me. And, you know, I don't know. This is not, you know, this is kind of back of the napkin kitchen table type calculation that you might do with a simple return. I don't know that businesses really use this, but let's just go ahead and uh, flashcard the definition of simple interest. And it's the amount represented by interest paid only on the original amount of principal without regard to compounding. And of course, if you're compounding, that of course means that you're getting interest on your interest, which is typically how most uh, instruments would work. So again, I don't know that simple return is uh, you know that sophisticated. Um, and so I don't know that a lot of businesses would use that, but let's just look at how they did this. You go ahead and you have a $10,000 promissory note and it bears uh, simple interest at 8% for two years. And so you're going to yield $1,600 over those uh, two years. So your simple return would be $1,600. Okay, now you come over and you take a look at the compound interest. And basically, what we're saying is the uh, earnings on this uh, instrument is going to accumulate and you're going to be getting interest on the accumulated uh, earnings on this. And this is the same thing as future value, okay? So they tell us the future value equals here and I want you to flashcard those components. But if you sat there and you had a, a promissory note that was $10,000, 8% for two years, you go ahead and plug those elements into that formula, and over those two years, that will grow to $11,664. Sometimes you'll see that 
in the context of, hey, um, I know it's going to cost $11,644 to send my kid to college. Don't we wish, All right? And then if you wanted to sit there and say, well, you know, how much do I have to save now, right, to grow to that over, um, you know, uh, over the two years here, that's the unknown, that's the what, in this case now, that would be the present value, right? And you go ahead and you would multiply that times 1.166, Four, and if you're wanting to have 11,640664 6, because that's what you had determined you had to have in two years, then you would just go ahead and divide the 11,644 by that factor 1.1164, and that would tell you you need to come up with $10,000 now. So that to me is more of the analysis that you would be doing here as opposed to, well, what's it gonna grow to? Although they could ask you that. Now, again, I've already showed you this, but just um, to one more time, look at that uh, present value table or future value table that we were looking at in that context. Um, we had, and I guess the parameters were what, two years and it was 8% so you can come over here and you can see there's that uh, that that future value and again if they were asking you how you know you need 11,000 whatever it was and you want it to grow what how much you can invest or if they wanted to know what the future value would be you would just multiply that times whatever you're investing so you also have the table there okay all right, good. So you can see some ways to compute return, okay, different ways of looking at that. And then you come over and what are required rates of return? Now you say required rates of return. It's not a government regulation or anything like that. Required rate of return is basically something that the probably at the board level, or director's level of an entity, maybe senior management level of an entity says, well, in order for us to make a certain investment, we have to meet a minimum rate of return. Sometimes that's called our hurdle rate. And often we use that required rate of return to um, say, well, um, we're going to now calculate net present value on this, or we're going to see if it's a certain investment after you run some numbers we calculate the internal rate of return is it meeting this sort of hurdle rate this required rate of return we're going to get more into that in some uh, later chapters all we're really trying to understand here is what are the elements that constitute the required rate of return that a uh, entity may consider and not all of these have to be present um well I, yeah, not all of these have to be present. Now, um, the risk-free rate of return is sort of, you know, the, the benchmark. Risk-free rate of return is basically whatever the uh, rate of return is on. And it's often a 10-year treasury is what they'll use as the risk-free rate of return. The idea being that the federal government will not default on its debt. Now, I always get annoyed because um, what they do is they play a game on all of us. They sit there and they say, well, we have a debt ceiling. We have a debt ceiling. And, um, you know, they passed a law some years back, which is a very dysfunctional law to say, well, there's a debt ceiling. And we can't go over that debt ceiling, whatever it is, 25 trillion, 30 trillion, whatever the debt ceiling is at any point in time. Then what they do is they go and they pass a budget and they know by the budget that they pass, I'm talking about the federal government, they know that by the budget that they pass that they will go over the debt ceiling. Then as they get closer and closer to the debt ceiling, they all start giving you this. And we are going over our debt ceiling. Meanwhile, they all voted on a spending bill that would have them go over the debt ceiling. So they play this little game as though, oh, we can't go over the debt ceiling. And then 
that part was dysfunctional, but now they literally sit there and contemplate perhaps def the federal government defaulting on its debt. Well, if the federal government defaulted on its debt, then there would be no risk-free rate of return. And I don't know how businesses would go from there to make different decisions on the returns that they're wanting from different endeavors. So that sound you hear would be the economic calamity of all time. And so they would always have to raise the debt ceiling. If they don't and they go ahead and default, you know, I always say, tell my students that's shotgun time because I don't know what's gonna happen at that point if they would actually default on their debt. So we start with the uh, treasury rate of return and you don't have to memorize that or anything. They'll tell you the risk-free is this. And then you adjust it for these different things. And again, a problem may give you all of these, they may give you some of these, but let's just go ahead and take a look at how we'll adjust that risk-free rate of return for uh, these different risks. So maturity risk is the compensation investors demand for exposure to interest rate risk over time. The risk increases with the term to maturity. So go ahead and flashcard that. That's why if you're doing a mortgage and it's say a seven year fixed, you're gonna get a better interest rate than if you were doing say a 30 year fixed because of the amount of time associated with that 30 uh, years, that longer period. Purchasing power risk or inflation premium risk is compensation investors required to bear the risk that price levels will change and asset values or purchasing power of invested dollars. Okay, so you can go ahead and flashcard that. And so, you know, raising the interest rates the way the Fed is doing, I keep looking at that and I'm not quite understanding where they're thinking that's going to affect the inflation. Because when I hear them talk about inflation, it seems to me that it's a supply side thing. We're not having enough goods because of the war, because of um, you know issues with uh, availability of chips and that sort of thing. And that's driving up prices. And so they always kind of try to take it out by raising mortgage rates to lower the price of houses. Meanwhile, we've got a supply issue on the housing side as well. And so they keep, you know, putting this, uh, you know, this uh, raising of the interest rates and it's essentially going to cause, you know, a smaller amount of business investment and uh, almost like they're trying to induce a recession. But anyway, you come over and you take a look at liquidity premium risk is the additional compensation demanded by lenders for the risk that investment securities cannot be sold on a short notice without making significant price concession. Okay. In other words, as we saw, you can't really have a uh, market that item appropriately to sell it off in a orderly market. And then default risk is the additional compensation demanded by lenders for bearing risk that issuers of a security will fail to pay interest or principal due on a timely basis. So go ahead and flashcard those definitions. But um, when you look at this example over here, um, I do want you to flashcard right here that you have the um, risk-free rate of return here, which was given to us as uh, 3%. And then we do have the inflation premium that they talked to us about. And when you put an inflation premium on there, that is then called the nominal rate of return. And then they went ahead and they don't have, like I said, you don't have to adjust it for all of those. Uh, they adjusted it just for the default risk, and that became became the required rate of return. So um, I don't know that you need to flashcard that part because that just brought in one of those factors we talked about a minute ago. But we didn't talk about the inflation premium plus something called the real rate of return, giving you the nominal rate, nominal rate, and then you adjust it for these different risk premiums. Okay, come over and let's take a look at ways to mitigate uh, and control these financial risks. So we understand something about these risks. 
And now we're going to try to mitigate them. Mitigate them means we're going to try to limit the bad impact of these different risks, right? Because risk is the potential for loss. So you take a look, and we've already discussed diversification is the process of building a portfolio of investment of different and offsetting risk. In theory, an investor can create a portfolio of assets that eliminates virtually all uh, diversifiable risk. So you don't put all of your investments in one industry, right? You put some maybe in tech, but you put some in other areas that uh, maybe won't be as affected by tech. Or even if you are going to have uh, a lot of technology stocks, you can look at different companies and see, well, look, even though these are both technology companies, maybe one is affected one way. If something happens, the other tech company would go the other way if something happens. So there's different ways that you get strategies for diversifying uh, diversifiable uh, risk. Um, companies use many different strategies, okay? And we're going to look at uh, some of these different uh, strategies here. And let's take a look at way to mitigate interest rate risk. An investor can mitigate interest rate risk by investing in floating rate debt securities, which do not change in value when interest rates change and also generate higher coupon rates when interest rates uh, rise. Okay, so you're going to have some sort of, you know, uh, flexible um, rate security or floating rate security. Derivatives can forward rate, uh, uh, such as forward rate agreements or interest rate swaps, in which investor pays fixed interest rate and receives a floating interest rate can also be used to mitigate interest rate risk. So why don't you flashcard that? Those are the tools that we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time looking at it here. And so let's just look at this interest rate swap. Okay, let's see how uh, that would work. So we have East Company has invested a million dollars of 8% fixed rate bonds, fixed rate bond. East expects interest rates to increase during the 12 months, the next 12 months. On January 1st, East Company enters into an interest rate swap with West Company in which East Company agrees to pay West Company a series of future payments equal to the fixed interest rate of 8%. So they're going to take the return that they're getting and they're just going to go ahead and pay that over to um, West Company on the principal amount of a million. In exchange, West Company agrees to make to East Company a series of future payments equal to a floating interest rate, which is going to be, uh, in this example, uh, this SOFR, Security Overnight Financing Rate, plus 1% okay, uh, of the principal amount of a million. So. Sometimes my students will say, well, why would uh, West Company be willing to do this? Well, West Company's thinking, what, that maybe interest rates are going to go um, the other way, or maybe they don't think it's going to go as fast, and they like that fixed, whatever. There are different strokes for different folks. Different companies have different conclusions that they're making, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and let's flashcard, okay, some terms right here, even though they're putting in the context of a um, problem here of an example. The underlying is the East Company 8% and the West Company 1%. The notional amount is this million, okay? There was no initial net investment here uh, in this example. And then the settlement amount is what you're going to have to uh, settle. And it's what? 80,000 for West and then, uh, excuse me, for East Company and then for West, it's the 1% plus the uh, security overnight financing rate. And so if the uh, SOFR is 8.5, we have to add what? One to that. So West Company would have to pay East Company 95,000. East Company is getting to pay that fixed uh, 80,000. And so, um, you know, in this example, East Company uh, did a smart thing, West Company, not so much. 
Okay. Now, mitigating market risk, market risk, okay, not risk, market risk, okay, and let's take a look at uh, what we can do here, and market risk cannot be mitigated through diversification, right, so one way to control market risk is to invest in derivatives that provide gains to the investor when the market declines, and short selling, selling an investment in the hopes of buying back at a lower price is another strategy that provides returns uh, when the market uh, declines. So if I'm thinking the market's going to decline and I'm saying, well, I can't diversify out of this because it's market risk. All companies are going to suffer from this. And I think the market's going to decline. What I would do is let's say I borrow I'll, uh, if I'm going to do a short sale, I borrow the stock from you for a hundred dollars. Okay, I, I borrow a stock from you that's trading at a hundred dollars. I go ahead and I sell that stock, so I get a hundred bucks. Now, I have to give you that security back at some point in time. So I've got a hundred dollars in my hand now, but I got to get the security back but I'm thinking the market's still gonna decline. Now let's say I'm correct. And sure enough, the market does decline. And now that stock is only selling for $70 because there's been a big decline in the market. What happens? Well, now I can buy that stock for $70. I buy it for $70. I do what? I give it back to you. I borrowed it from you. I give it back to you and I get to keep an extra $30 in that situation. So that's an example of a short sale and you can use that um, to diversify out of some market risk but again it's in the hopes not that anybody really hopes that the market declines but in the expectation that the market will be declining okay all right so just go ahead and flash card that those are short sales and they don't tell us anything more in that example they don't give us any numbers or any means of understanding it from that example so i, I don't want to get into that particular example there. Um, mitigating unsystematic risk. Um, uh, unsystematic risk can be minimized through diversification. I think we've heard that a uh, number of times here now. Mitigating default risk. Hey, check out the credit of those that you're going to be lending to or investing in to see uh, that they can uh, pay you back, right? And so you would look at their credit ratings, that sort of thing, or maybe you'll ask them for some collateral or something like that, okay? Okay, good. Now, uh, mitigating price risk, and when we look at uh, mitigating price risk down here, price risk can be minimized through diversification. Price risk can also be mitigated through short selling or derivatives such as put options, okay, so I think we already talked about short selling, but let's go ahead and let's focus on how you might use a put option um, to uh, mitigate price risk. So uh, um, when I buy a put option, okay, a put option means that I can require you to buy a stock at a certain price. So I can force you to buy that stock from me at $100, right? Now, what happens? I have to pay for that ability to put. So there's going to be some amount off of that potential uh, money that I think I'm going to gain by forcing you to buy the stock for 100 because I have to pay for the put option, okay? So I go ahead and I buy the stock at... Um, you know, a certain amount, $100, whatever it is, I buy the stock. And then if the price drops to 70, I can what I can protect myself on this price risk by I have the put option that's going to require you to what uh, buy that stock for me for $100. So I'm cushioning myself against a potential uh, market decline. That's a put option. Okay, and again, I don't want to necessarily go through that example because again, they uh, don't really give us any more insight than what we just talked about there. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and take a look at a question for tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and put up the poll here.
Okay, um, we're a little bit all over the place on this one, and uh, looks like um, the correct answer was the most frequently chosen answer, but it's not a majority of us. And then you can see that we're kind of all over the map on this one. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at um, what might be going on here. And uh, we have an outstanding one-year bank loan of 500000 at a stated interest rate of 8%. The company is required to maintain a 20% compensating balance in a checking account. So we can't spend that 100000 um, that we have to maintain. So in effect, what's happening is the proceeds is not the full 500000 It's only what? It's only 400000 So the proceeds here are 400000 and then the question says, well, what's the effective rate? Well, we're going to have to uh, pay interest on that full 500,000. So 500,000 times the 8% is 40,000. So if we're having to pay interest per year of 40,000 or $400,000 worth of borrowing, that gives us a 10% effective interest rate. Okay. Um, Again, guys, uh, going back to the uh, concern that was raised at the beginning of class, if you hit that show text and you still can't find anything that, um, you know, and the solution to the question maybe doesn't look, and I, we had this in the discussion but uh, today, but if you ran across something, they're asking you to do a calculation and you're like, I don't see that we talked about this. And then you show you hit show text and you're saying, I don't see this in the text being discussed. And I don't understand what the rule is or what we're supposed to be doing here by reading the solution. Send me that question number so that I could take a look and see uh, if I can pro provide you something that will help you to understand the particular question. OK, good. Uh, let's go ahead and let's start to take a look at um, our second part here for our financial risk, which is currency exchange rate risk. So what happens here? We have international business that we've engaged in. Um, we're selling product or we're buying supplies, and we're dealing with a company that wants to have their payment given to them in a different currency. I think in the book here, they use quite a bit of an example of pesos. Okay, so we're buying supplies from Mexico. Or we're selling things to a company uh, in Mexico. Okay, well, what's going to happen? If the settlement date is going to be, say, 30 days from now, 60 days from now, whatever, six months from now, we're worried that the exchange rates will maybe move against us. And if they do, we're actually going to suffer some exchange rate uh, risk and loss at that point. So what we can do is use different tools that will allow us to mitigate some of those risks. Okay. Now, the first thing we're going to understand are what are some factors that will affect this currency exchange rate risk. And then once we understand that, it'll help us to a little better understand, well, this is how we would mitigate those risks away, okay? So exchange rate risk exists because the relationship between domestic and foreign currencies may be subject to volatility, okay? Well, what circumstances will affect that um, volatility and let's just go ahead and flashcard some of those trade relation factors such as uh, differences in inflation amongst different uh, countries um, you know the U.S. is suffering inflation right now but it's a little bit worse in uh, Europe right now and so you look and you say well that would work to the U.S. favor right uh, income levels okay so income levels in other countries grow, um, then that will affect uh, interest, uh, affect uh, exchange rate risk. Um, government regulation, 
okay tariffs those sorts of things okay those are all considered trade related factors so once you flashcard those as true oh you know what you don't have to flashcard it here there's another place i'm gonna have you flashcard it okay but those are trade related factors and then uh financial factors okay include differences in interest rates and restriction on capital movements uh, between companies Okay, so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at uh, the inflation factors. Okay, and so I mean, excuse me, the the trade related uh, factors, um, and let's look at relative inflation rates. So what happens when domestic inflation exceeds foreign inflation? Holders of domestic currency are motivated to purchase foreign currency to maintain the purchasing power of their money. The increase in demand for foreign currency forces the value of the foreign currency to rise in relation to the domestic currency, thereby changing the rate of exchange between the domestic and foreign currency. Now let's look at this illustration. Assume that the US dollar is relatively stable while the Mexican peso is suffering from sudden inflationary pressures. As the Mexican peso buys less in domestic um, Mexican economy, Mexican and their banking institutions seek the safe haven of US dollars to maintain the purchasing power of their liquid, liquid resources. Demand for US dollars created by Mexicans buying them with Mexican pesos makes the US dollar more valuable in terms of peso and drives the, uh, up the exchange rate. U.S. dollar commands more pesos in exchange of currency. So that gives you, you know, sort of an example, but uh, I want to do a flashcard on that, okay? So what happens? Professor, so it actually, like, ex exaggerates the issue? Huh? It actually, like, exaggerates the difference once they start buying the U.S. dollar in that case? Once they start buying the U.S. dollar, that's going to cause the U.S. dollar to be stronger against the peso. Yeah, it exacerbates the yeah. issue. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's just go ahead and put here a flashcard for inflation. Okay, country experiencing... inflation okay so the country experiencing the inflation what's going to happen in that case mexico their currency is going to be what devalued that's an arrow down and the other country i'm not going to put the u.s because you know i don't want you to memorize it by country right the other country their currency is going to be what is going to be up is going to be stronger okay i think that's the best way to flash card back because again you'll see some questions uh, coming up here in a little while and i don't know whenever i look at these questions i gotta start huh how does it work again i have to think through it i'm not an economist i'm an accountant right so i have to try to remember how did that work again and so uh, the best thing to do is to uh, flashcard that, okay? Let's look at income levels, okay? Another factor here, income levels. As income increases in one country relative to another, exchange rate as a result of increased demand for foreign currencies in the country in which the income uh, is increasing. Okay, so let's look at the example, and then I'm going to give you another, although I find the example a little insulting, but that's okay. You know, they didn't have to admit, it, it makes it sound like, you know, the only product that Mexico produces is pinatas, which to me is a bit uh, annoying. Anyway, I'll stop there. But uh, the income level in the United States increases significantly in the second quarter. Americans flock to Mexico on vacation to buy piñatas. So irritating. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that people go to Mexico, like it's a beautiful country, 
they have nothing to do with freaking pinatas, okay? But anyway, the increased supply of American dollars seeking to buy pesos to purchase Mexican goods causes the value of the American dollar to fall in relation to the stated number of pesos. Exchange rate is thus affected by relative income levels and the associated demand for foreign goods created by higher uh, domestic income okay so we can do another flashcard now um that the what the country with higher income levels what's going to happen to their currency their currency is going to what depreciate depreciate good devalue good and then and again guys i just called the other country because we don't want to you know the other country that's the one where the income levels aren't necessarily rising their currency is going to appreciate, right? Okay, and you may know this already and maybe you don't have to flashcard it, but I think it's a good idea to go ahead and just have that in your flashcards. Again, remember, when you go in to take your exams, you've got this much stuff that you're trying to hold in your head. And so it's not a bad idea to just go ahead and um, sit there and, you know, have a nice set of flashcards and this stuff. So you're reviewing those. <clears throat> it's my belief that you should get to the exam site. Um, you know, you really should get to the exam site an hour early. Uh, so if your exam begins at, um, at say eight o'clock is your appointment time, get there at seven. Okay, so that you have time one in case anything goes wrong on the way, you got a little cushion of time. But not only that, but you get to do another round with your flashcards in your car. You can't bring your flashcards in the exam site, obviously, but you sit in your car and you do another round with your flashcards before you go in. So all of this stuff is right there, quickly available to you. You don't have to sit there and how, how does that work again? You got it right there for you. Okay. Okay, good. Trade factors. Okay, and uh, let's just take a look at the trade factors and various trade factors and barriers um, artificially suppress the natural forces of supply and demand and a tariff on imported pinatas would have the effect of discouraging the purchase of imports, thereby, thereby reducing the demand for the peso and maintaining the exchange rate. Um, so what happens? The uh, country, even though they put it in the terms of maintain, the country imposing the tariff we're going to see that their currency, let me put the currency, and maybe they're saying maintain, but let's just stick with our idea that uh, it's going to go up the country imposing the tariff, their currency is going to maintain or be increased the, and I'll put the other country over here for the tariff, I'll put it here. The other country, would see their currency what devalued right as a result of this tariff okay and then finally uh financial factors relative interest rates and capital flows and um, interest rates can make demand for currencies by motivating either domestic or foreign investment and so Let's just take a look at this one. Assume that returns on institutional investments in Mexico skyrocketed in the third quarter, while returns on comparable institution investments remain significantly lower in the U.S. U.S. investors find the opportunity to earn higher returns with similar risk in Mexican financial institutions irresistible. 
the demand for pesos increases as um, Americans invest, the exchange rate as the peso commands uh, more dollars. So <clears throat> the uh, country with what? Country with higher interest rates, their currency is going to what, go up, right? And then we'll stick with our notion of, since we're comparing countries, the other country, their currency relative to that other country with higher interest rates would come down. Now, <clears throat> they kind of tried to do something similar to what I was doing with this summary chart, but I found this summary chart a little hard to kind of absorb. Um, so only thing I want you to do with this summary chart, and the reason I said I'll have you flashcard, what are the trade-related factors versus the financial factors? Trade-related factors are most of those that we talked about, relative interest rates, relative um, income levels, government control, such as tariffs, and then the financial factors, um, relative interest rates and capital flow. And we see now uh, we have a series of flashcards, right, that talk about how those different factors affect the uh, exchange rates for these. Okay, good. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and start to take a look now at, okay, so we know we have these different risks, different factors driving these risks. So how can we um, protect ourselves against our exposures? Okay, so we're gonna talk about the exposures and then we're going to talk about ways of protecting ourselves against these exposures. So one is transaction exposure. Okay. And transaction exposure is the potential that an organization could suffer economic loss or experiencing economic gain upon settlement of individual transactions as a result of these change in exchange rates. So I buy something from you or I sell something to you. And you're not going to pay me for a while and the exchange rates or I'm not going to pay you for a while and the exchange rates are going to change between the time that we actually have the transaction and when we actually go ahead and um, settle up on this okay so um, when we take a look measurement of transaction exposure is done in two steps okay so we sit here and we're going to do what project the foreign currency inflow and foreign currency outflows and estimate. And uh, the way they look at this, there would be some variability around what we think the rates are going to do. So we would come up with a range. Okay. So let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this example here. And we have Seattle Imports, a U.S. import export company imports commodities from Canada that it pays for in Canadian dollars and exports commodities to Canada for which it receives Canadian dollars. If Seattle export anticipated that it would uh, export 10 million Canadian to Canada over the next year while importing 8 million um, over the same period, the net exposure in Canadian dollars is what? is 2 million, okay? So we're thinking we're gonna have a 2 million receivable because we're going to uh, export 10 while importing uh, eight. So we got a net exposure of two. Now that's that step one. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and use a color coding here. We can go ahead and look at step two. So, okay, step two. If the current exchange rate is 75 US, 75.75 dollars, which is 75 cents US to one Canadian dollar, the net exposure in US dollars is 1,500,000, the Canadian two times the uh, 0.75 dollar per Canadian, US dollar per Canadian dollar. 
if the rate is anticipated to fluctuate five cents between 70 and um, 70 cents and 80 cents, then the fluctuation would be that range, the 0.7 times the 2 million Canadian, the 0.8 times the 2 million Canadian. So that's obviously step two. Now we could also have economic exposure, okay? And we really have already talked about the potential for economic exposure, okay? But let's just take a look at that. Economic exposure is generally defined through local currents, appreciation or depreciation is measured in relation to the organization's earnings and cash flows. So you can take a look if it's going to be a currency, uh, uh, appreciation or depreciation and again we kind of already went through this a little bit is at least the factors that drive it but the effect of appreciation let's look at that as domestic currency appreciates in value or becomes stronger it becomes more expensive in terms of a foreign a currency a currency appreciation appreciates the volume of outflows uh, and tends to decline as domestic exports become more expensive. However, the volume of inflows tends to increase as foreign imports become less expensive. So what's happening? Our revenue is going to come down. At the same time though, right, for our exports, our exports costs will come down, okay? So it really starts to become a, a function of the volume of what we're importing or exporting if we have this, um, well, for both of them, uh, uh, currency appreciation uh, and currency depreciation. Uh, let's take a look at currency depreciation. And uh, we can see here that the effects of currency depreciation as a domestic currency depreciates in value or becomes weaker, it becomes less expensive in terms of foreign currency. As currency depreciates, the volume of outflows tends to rise as domestic exports become less expensive. However, the volume of inflows tends to decline as foreign imports become more expensive. So what happens? Our revenues will go up. People are going to want to buy our stuff now from other countries. But what happens, our expenses are also going to go up because we're going to have to pay more um, to get the um, currency that we need to buy whatever it is we're importing. Okay, So at the end of the day, and the flashcard that I want you to put here is that the economic exposure created by domestic currency appreciation or depreciation respect to foreign currency depends on the net flow or outflow of that foreign currency. Okay. All right, good. Now you come over and uh, let's look at translation exposure. Okay, now what's going on here? This, guys, really has more to do with accounting than really anything else we've talked about here so far this evening, because we have what, let's say we have a couple of subsidiaries, a couple of foreign subsidiaries, and then we're the U.S. parent. Well, in order to, uh, in order to sit there and consolidate our financial statements between the U.S. parent and the foreign subsidiary, we are first going to have to translate the uh, foreign currency to uh, to the U.S. dollar. Well, the, if there's fluctuation sitting there in the exchange rates, well, that could cause us to start suffering certain translation uh, losses as a result of that, and so that or translation gains it could go either way. But as that starts to happen, um, we are going to have that sort of exposure, that sort of risk. Okay, so when you look at this discussion, translation exposure is the risk that assets, liabilities, equity, or income of the consolidated organization that includes foreign subsidiaries will change as a result of changes in exchange rates. The translation exposure is generally defined by the degree of foreign involvement, the location of the foreign subsidiaries, and the accounting methods used 
um, and measured in relation to the effect on the organization's earnings or comprehensive income. So really what drives the translation risk is the degree of foreign involvement. The more subsidiaries you have in different markets with different things going on, the greater your uh, translation exposure. And so you can just go ahead and flashcard that. Now, when we look at location of foreign investments, of course, the more stable the exchange rate in wherever our foreign investments are, the lower the translation risk, the more volatile the exchange rate, the higher. So it's both the volume, but also the volatility as to the uh, different entities that we are, uh, different foreign entities we're um, investing in. Okay, so a lot of definitions there, guys. So we understand what some of these risks are. We're going to go ahead and take the break right now. And then we're gonna come back and start to talk about some different ways that we can mitigate um, these uh, different exposures that we've talked about. Really, we're not gonna talk about mitigating translation risk because it's a function of how involved you are, but we can mitigate some of the transaction exposure that we've been talking about. But we're gonna take the break right now. We'll come back at 6.30. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. And uh, when we come back, somebody please make sure I start it up again. Okay, good. Uh, so let's go ahead now. And we've understood um, something about our transaction exposure now if we're dealing with foreign currencies. And we're going to take a look at uh, some ways of mitigating those. Now, uh, when we look at the different techniques here for mitigating um, these, we can really sort of put them into um, some broad categories. Okay, so we have uh, those that would be considered short term. Versus those that would be longer term. Okay. And the short terms that we're going to talk about are going to be hedges. And we're going to see that for our hedges, we could have uh, something that's called a future hedge. We could have something that's called a forward hedge. Okay. And then we'll also see that we could use Again, this is also short term. These are all short term. We put we can bracket them off this way, short term. Okay. Um, we could also have money market. Tools that are going to be used for mitigating and money market. Uh, we could have excess cash. This falls under money market. We could have excess cash. We could have borrowing. We'll see how those work. And then we'll see that we could also use options. And options, we've kind of already talked about put option, but we could also have a call option. So we got put and call options. We'll talk about those. And then long term, um, we could have uh, what's something called forward currency swaps. And we won't say too much about that. Most of the way we look at our transaction exposure tends to be uh, in the notion of dealing with a short term because generally we're going to collect our receivables. We're going to have to pay our payables when we have these foreign currency transactions in a relatively short period. So we primarily, primarily focus on the shorter term ones, the hedges, the money markets, and then the uh, options, okay? Now, when we look, um, hedging, let's took the first start with this discussion over here of hedges, okay? And with hedging, 
Hedge is, is a financial risk management technique in which an organization seeking to mitigate the risk of fluctuation in a value acquires a financial instrument that behaves in the opposite manner from the hedge diadem. In this particular context, we're talking about it'll move in the opposite direction of how the foreign currency is going to move. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at this uh, idea as to when we would want to use hedging. Uh, worldwide sweet peaches by shipping crates for its product from Mexico. The company incurs liabilities denominated in pesos that is satisfied in pesos bought with U.S. dollars at the time the transaction settles. So I have this liability. I'm going to pay it 30 days from now, and I'm worried that there's going to be some fluctuation to my disadvantage, right? Um, the company incurs a significant liability in pesos at a spot rate of 10 cents. World manage wide management expects that the peso will strengthen to uh, 20 uh, cents. Okay, so instead of giving up 10 cents per peso, I'm going to have to give up 20 cents per peso. And if I have a lot of pesos, that could be pretty significant that I have to pay. That could be a pretty significant exposure. So to mitigate this perceived transaction risk, the company decides to hedge its position by locking in a uh, the current spot rate of 10 cents. And so we're going to go ahead and look at some of these tools here in a second. But before we do that, we're going to want to be able to identify what our net transaction exposure is. Now, the net transaction exposure considers the effect of transaction exposure on the entity taken as a whole rather than on individual subsidiaries. So if you have some subsidiaries in which your currency is going to move in your favor, others where the currency you're worried is going to move against you, then you would net those out. Okay, So that's what we're saying here. Um, something might adversely affect one subsidiary, but might favorably affect another. And the net transaction exposure is the aggregate exposure associated with the particular foreign currency for a particular time as follows. And you can go ahead and flashcard this step, these steps, I should say. We will accumulate the inflows and outflows, consolidate the effects of subsidiary by currency type, and then compute the net effect in total. Okay. All right, so we have these hedging tools. And as I've mentioned, we can use a uh, future hedge, and then we'll see the way a forward hedge will look. And then we're going to look at options and money market, the way we're going to uh, basically mitigate the effect of our net transaction exposure. So let's take a look. A future hedge entitles a holder to either purchase or sell a particular number of currency units of identified currency at a no negotiated price at a stated date, okay? And so uh, they tend to be used for smaller transactions, okay? So I want you to go ahead and flashcard that. And um, in case somebody wants to know when you would use them, they're for smaller transactions. So let's look at it in the stand from the standpoint of accounts payable. Let's say accounts payable application. I don't know that the process doesn't change if we're being having to pay money or plan to receive money um, but we're going to look at how we would deal with it from uh, both standpoints here the payable uh, versus the receivable so if we're using a future hedge okay uh, to buy foreign currency at a specific price okay um, that's what the hedge is here for our accounts payable. We want to be able to buy the foreign currency at a specific price. So then we have it, we can control that price. And then we have the foreign currency available. So when we go to actually uh, settle this, when the payment is due. So we come over and you take a look at this uh, example here now, the worldwide sweet peaches buys crates. From Mexico, on the date the worldwide sweet peaches buys crates and incurs a significant liability in pesos, um, the spot rate is 10 cents because the company fears that the peso will strengthen to 20 by the time the bill is paid to be due in 30 days. We enter into a contract that allows to purchase the pesos needed 
to pay the liability at 10 cents per peso. So we'll sit there and literally um, protect ourselves against that by having the ability to buy those uh, pesos at a later time when we're ready to pay that at a fixed rate, that 10 cents. Now, when you look at accounts receivable, now a future hedge contract to uh, sell the foreign currency received in a satisfaction of the receivable at a specific price at the time the account receivable is due will mitigate the risk and strengthen uh, of a strengthening domestic currency. So you take a look at this one and we have what running apparel international a US based retailer has an international retail operation in several countries, including significant business in Japan. Company management expects that the Japanese retail operation will generate and liquidate a significant amount of its accounts receivable in 30 days. Although the current spot rate is a, a dollar to 98.02 yen, company management expects that the dollar to yen spot rate will be $1 to 102.09 yen in 30 days. So we're literally going to um, lose, right? We're going to have this 20 cents for every dollar versus uh, 97 cents for each yen in this example. So to mitigate this, um, we go ahead and we would enter into a futures hedge that entitles the company to a futures contract to sell the yen at that more favorable rate that was uh, contemplated uh, when we first entered into the liability with the um, Japanese, or not liability, the sale with this Japanese uh, company. Now, you could also use, okay, those are future, you could also use uh, forward hedges, okay? So they tell us that a forward hedge is similar to a future hedge and that entitles the holder to either purchase or sell currency units of an identified currency and negotiate a price at a future point. And um, although future hedges tend to be used for smaller transactions, forward hedges are contracts between business and commercial banks and are normally for larger uh, transactions. Okay, so you can flashcard really that's the difference between a forward and a future. It's for larger transactions. And note that uh, you can have both an account payable as we saw in an account receivable application. So they tend to be uh, for larger uh, dollar amounts, um, although they're short term, uh, when it's a forward versus a future. Then you come over and let's take a look at uh, using a money market hedge, okay? And when we use a money market hedge, um, there's two possibilities. We can have excess cash or we don't have excess cash, but we can still borrow our way uh, and get some, um, you know, limit our exposure to uh, transaction uh, exposure a little bit. So let's take a look at the uh, money market hedge and we have uh, excess cash. So we've got some excess cash and um, the money market hedge for payable satisfaction includes the following steps. So we've got some excess, excess cash, okay? And let's go ahead and flashcard these steps. Determine the amount of the payable. Determine the amount of interest that can be earned prior to settling the payable. Remember, we've got excess cash, so we're going to go ahead and invest in this foreign currency, earn a little interest. Discount the amount of payable to the net investment required and purchase the amount of currency equal to the net investment required and deposit the proceeds in the appropriate uh, money market vehicle that will give us the return we want. So let's look at this example. And this, I think this is a pretty good example here, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Duffy Discount Piñatas has a payable due to Mexican supplier in the amount of 100,000 pesos in 10 days. The current exchange rate is 0 0.08 pesos and Mexican interest rates are 16%. Duffy has 100,000 excess cash and elects to use the money market hedge to mitigate transaction exposure 
to exchange rate, Duffy performs the following steps. Now, a couple of things, and I think maybe we could have done a little better job here to show us that since it's 90 days and it's 16%, we're going to take what? We're going to take the 0.16 and divide that by the four quarters. We assume a 360 day year and accounting a lot of times. So don't worry about trying to chop it up into, you know, uh, days here. We're just basically, um, you know, having a perfect amount of days. Well, 90 days is not quite an entire quarter. Um, if you have, a, you know, more, more, uh, months with more days, right? And so you just go ahead and assume that that's by four. So the interest rate here is what? 4% that we can earn on these, okay? Now, what they wanna know is how much do, dollars do you have to invest now to have the pesos that you need later on to go ahead and pay this off so that you kind of hold it at essentially a million pesos. So. What you would do in the way we're going to set this up, if we want to have a million pesos, let's get that over here and set it up. If you want to have a million pesos, I don't know what the symbol is for pesos. Okay, if you want to have a million pesos, then what you're going to do if the interest rates are 4%, then you're going to have what 1.04 times the number of the present value of the pesos, the number that you have to buy now, so that in 90 days, because we you know changed we adjusted our interest rate for 90 days, so that in 90 days you have um, the number of uh, pesos you need. So then what they did was they went ahead and they just did the math on this and they came up with the answer that you would buy 961,538 pesos now so that they would grow to what? To the million pesos by the time you have to settle this thing. And um, okay, they gave us the note here about how we got the 4%. I don't know why they didn't put that at the beginning. And then um, since the pesos right now are worth eight cents US, then we would do what? We would go ahead and use 76,923 to lock in that we're going to get 961, uh, we're buying 961,538 pesos. Now we're locking in what we're going to have to pay now for this. And we um, basically then are able to uh, satisfy that payable of $80,000 for 76923 because we invested that excess cash and had some earnings on that. Okay, so that's pretty smart. Okay, now we could accomplish this, not the same outcome, but an outcome where we're going to have some sort of savings here and protect ourselves um, by um, borrowing the funds. We won't save as much because now we're going to have to borrow and pay interest on that, but we can still have some potential savings. So let's just look at it from the standpoint of the borrowed funds. And firms that do not have excess cash follow the same basic procedure on payable, except they first borrow funds domestically, invest them internationally to satisfy the payable amount denominated uh, in that foreign currency. So now we come over and we look and we have Duffy Discount Piñata, same setup, except now we're going to have to borrow funds. Million pesos due in 90 days. Exchange rate is eight cents per peso. Interest rates are 16%. The US interest rates are 6% because we're going to have to borrow the money to be able to accomplish that. So we need to know what the US rates are. Duffy computes that it must borrow 76,923 to use a money market hedge to mitigate the transaction exposure to exchange the risk discount from the previous example. We got that up there. We knew that we needed 76,923. In the first example, we had that. Now we have to borrow that. So this net 
savings of the difference between the 80,000 and the 76,923 is going to be reduced by the fact that we have to borrow the money and pay the interest on that. So when you come in, let's see how much we would need to borrow, okay? So we need to borrow, and Duffy has secured the transaction here uh, by borrowing 76,923, but we have to pay the interest on that. So we have the 76,923, they told us the US interest rates were 6%. So we go ahead and we multiply that times the, um, and they come up with this, uh, <clears throat> the way they're doing this, it's a little hard to see here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and set it up for you. Take the 76,000, 923 and then you multiply it times the 0 0.06 which is the interest rate right 0 0.06 and then that's times 93 sixtieths okay again we assume a 360 dollar a year that's where that number came from because i look at that i'm like what is that okay that's 93 sixtieths that's how i would do this thing i just wouldn't say well 1.015 how do you know that? Okay, well, uh, that comes up because of this uh, 6% for 90 days. You, the way you get that number is by taking this piece right here. That's where that 0 0.015 came from. And so that now means that we have to, uh, we have to cough up interest of $1,000. $153.84, okay? So what happens? So you look at that and you say, well, if that's the case, I have to add that to the 76,923. That gives me that number 78077, okay? So the savings isn't as much, as we saw before, when we have to borrow the funds, because we have to pay the interest to borrow the funds. So that's where those numbers came from. Sometimes I look at this, I'm like, who, why did they show it to us this way? Maybe you see it directly. I kind of think it's easier to understand it that way. Okay. Okay, good. Now coming over, let's take a look at mitigating and then we have what? we have our currency option hedges. Okay, so these are all hedges. Um, we've had what, we had the uh, future hedge, right? We had the forward hedge, which were larger amounts. We have what, we had the money market hedge or we have excess cash, um, borrowed funds. And now we're gonna look at options and it could be a put or a call option. Okay, so let's just go ahead and take a look and see how uh, we can use options to um, do this. And the um, <clears throat> currency option hedge gives the business the option of executing the option contract or uh, or purely settling its originally good to go to each transaction without the benefit on the hedge, depending on which one is more favorable. In other words, when we look at the um, you know, with the, for example, the money market, we were kind of locked in to whatever we decided there, right? Here with these options, we will only exercise the option if we have determined that it is more favorable for us, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look at a um, currency option hedges for our payables and a call, an option to buy is the currency option used to mitigate the transactions exposure associated with um, rate risk of payables, okay? And you can see that it is similar to the futures or forward contract The business plans to buy foreign currency at a lower rate in, in anticipation of the currency strengthening in comparison to the domestic currency order that can settle its liability at a predicted uh, value. So unlike those others though, Generally, if the option price is less than the exchange rate at the time of the settlement, the business will exercise the option. If the option is more than the exchange rate at the time of the settlement, 
the business will simply allow the option to expire. So flashcard that. And then also take a look here that although option premiums are used to compute any net uh, savings associated with the option transaction, they are considered a sunk cost and therefore are not relevant to the decision. So you're going to put some money up there to get that option, but you don't sit there and say, well, oh, I mean, wait a minute, I paid for that option, so I have to exercise it. You only exercise it if it's more favorable than settling for the original uh, amount. Okay, so let's look at how we could use an option hedge from this example. And we've got this Garrity International owns a Mexican supplier, a thousand pesos, due in 30 days. It's currently exchanging at uh, eight cents, but the company is fearful that the Mexican peso will strengthen to the dollar before the settlement by as much as 10 cents. And we can pay this price here for the option to be able to buy the pesos at the current exchange rate, thus um, fixing our uh, amount that we're going to have to pay on this payable and mitigating our exposure. Now, um, just to look at the way I look at these is I look at it in terms of, well, what is the amount of my exposure, okay? Well, right now it's what, it's, um, I'm gonna have to come up with what, $80,000 to pay this thing off, right? 100,000 pesos, or excuse me, million pesos times eight cents, okay? means that I'm going to have to come up with $80,000, right? If the bad thing happens and it turns out that what, that I'm going to have to pay uh, the uh, 10 cents to get the pesos that I need, then in effect, I could potentially have to pay what? Have to pay $100,000. So my exposure here is what? My exposure is... 20,000. Now, what happens if I pay 0 0.005, okay, for this um, premium, then I'm essentially going to have to pay 0 0.005 times 100,000. I'm going to have to pay what? I'm going to have to pay $5,000 to get this um, option. And so I have what? I have a net of $15,000 on this thing because I'm trying to save myself from going to the 20,000, but I had to pay 5,000 that. So net, I'm going to um, you know, have a $15,000 settlement uh, difference here. And that's basically the way they came up with it. You may like the way they did it. I like better the way I did it. So Garrity's consideration for the option, 0.55, the premium is 5,000, pay regardless of whether the option is exercised. The gross saving of 20,000, right, which is the difference, the two cents times 100,000 pesos, a uh, million pesos is to reduce by 5,000 option premium, okay? Now, again, if it turned out that it was better to just go ahead and, um, you know, settle this and um, calculate Gary's loss, assuming Gary is incorrect, and the assessment of the internal exchange rate stays at eight cents. Well, then the what? It's just simply the five thousand, the cost of the premium. Uh, we would exercise the option there because we aren't at that situation where we're having to pay uh, ten cents to acquire the million pesos or full uh, hundred thousand. Okay, now you come over and um, let's take a look at the currency option hedge now for receivables. Okay, we looked at it from the standpoint of payables, but let's look at it from the standpoint of the receivable. And let's take a look at this example. Garrity International's owed a million dollars 
due in 30 days from Mexican customer, although the peso is currently exchanged for US dollars at 0 0.08. They're fearful that the peso will weaken in comparison to the dollar before the settlement for as little as six cents and same price for the premium uh, to make sure that we're getting uh, eight cents. So what happens? If we were to settle it now, we would get what? We would get $80,000, right? A million times the 0 0.08 cents, a million pesos times 0 0.08 cents. If this bad thing happens, then what? If we settle later, we're only going to get something that's equivalent to what? 60,000. So we have the potential of what? A $20,000 exposure here. Okay. So what happens? We have the 20,000 exposure, but we got to pay. And again, it's the 5,000 for the option. Okay. So even though it's costing us something, we can limit, uh, you know, eliminate you know the exposure here by paying five thousand so our net on this would be fifteen thousand okay now again if we sat there and you know the bad thing didn't happen we don't exercise the option and our cost is at that point if you don't exercise the option your cost is what your cost is the price of the option okay now, as I've mentioned, you could also use long-term contracts, okay? Um, and so uh, for long-term, mechanically, long-term contracts do the same issues. Long-term contracts are set up to stabilize transaction exposure over a long period of time, you think? And you could also do currency swaps. You can do currency swaps between two firms. I give you pesos, you give me dollars, I give you dollars, you give me pesos, financial intermediaries. Um, there could also be something called parallel uh, loans are uh, examples of currency swaps. Okay. All right. So let's just take a look at, and they get into quite a bit of deal there, currency swaps. I don't think we need to get into all that. So let's just take a look now that we've kind of gotten ourselves through a few of these concepts and see if we can answer a few questions here dealing with uh, foreign currency transactions primarily.
Okay, guys, uh, it's about two minutes now. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one. We did pretty good on this. Most of us got it right. Um, now, when I look at these kinds of questions, and again, remember we had those little arrows um, that were showing the way different things affect. But I look at this and I'm like, well, if the dollar price of the euro rises, which of the following will occur? And so if the dollar price of the euro rises, that means that what? It'll take more dollars to purchase euros. And the other corollary to that or opposite to that is what? Uh, fewer, fewer euros to purchase dollars, okay? So I start looking at that and I'm like, well, if I understand that, then, and I'm gonna start from the bottom, we know that A is the correct answer. I'm gonna start with D. The Euro will buy fewer goods. No, it won't. It will buy what? More goods, okay? Now I look at C and this is irrelevant. This, the Euro will buy fewer. They're asking us in the context of the changes uh, be, you know, between the dollar and the euro, so that's not right. And then you get to uh, you get to B. The euro depreciates against the dollar. Well, the fact pattern is telling us that what you're going to have fewer euros to purchase dollars. So the euro is what the euro is appreciating against the dollar. And so most of us got it right. The dollar has depreciated against the euro. Okay. All right. Good. Let's take a look at. This next one. Okay, most of us have attempted this one. And um, okay, a little bit of trouble with this one. Um, a minority of us got it right, 45%, uh, although that is the biggest chunk. Uh, but then we had a distribution, 55% amongst the other three choices. So let's take a look at this one. And again, these questions, you know, there's a little bit of weightlifting that goes on with these. By that, I mean, you got to kind of just kind of struggle through and think through them. You do that in your homework and then you get better, uh, obviously, for uh, testing. Now, the answer here is A, okay? But let's say I'm reading this question. I'm like, what the F are these? I don't know what they're talking about. Is there some way I can uh, increase my chances of getting this question correct? So it says, what is the effect when a foreign competitor's currency becomes weaker compared with the US dollar? Now, if you read through the choices, they say here that B, let's look at B, the foreign company will be at a disadvantage in the US market. And then when you look at D, it says it is better for the US company. Well, it can't be both. It can't be what? 
uh, I mean, excuse me, these are essentially the same answer. The foreign company will be at a disadvantage and it's better for the US company. Well, that's the same answer and we can't have two right answers. So I can eliminate that off the gate here and I could turn this into a 50-50 guess if I had to, okay? But then I'm looking and I'm saying, okay, the foreign currency is getting weaker. So that means it'll take more foreign currency to do what? To purchase US dollars, that's gonna make what? That's gonna make US products higher. And if it's taking what? If it's taking less dollars to get foreign currency, that's going to make what? The foreign product cheaper. So the foreign company will have what? An advantage in the US market, choice A. And uh, C was the opposite of that. Okay, so when I look at these, I ask myself, well, is it going to be more or less expensive to get the currency that I need? And then they put it in terms of goods to purchase the goods or an advantage and trying to sell in these different markets, et cetera. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and take a look at question number three here. Okay, looks like most of us have had a chance to go ahead and uh, answer that. And good, I think we're kind of starting to get the hang of these and that we're getting a um, pretty good result here on this one. 73% uh, of us have got this uh, correct. But again, let's just take a look and see if, you know, how we can sort of eliminate some of the kind of crazy ones here, choices. And um, yeah, nobody picked D, okay? And, and that's great because we have been studying here how you can reduce the risk, right? Now, uh, we have this situation, we have receivable in 30 days, and we're worried that the value of the euro relative to the dollar will drop. So when we're finally paid off in euro, we're gonna actually receive value less, not when we're paid off in dollars, we'll receive less in dollars before the payment is received. What would platinum do to reduce the risk? Well, you buy 30,000 euros now and do what? Look at them. I mean, it's the worry of what the, the euros that we're going to get in the future that we want to try to protect. So enter into an interest rate swap contract for 30 days. I have no idea what that would do because that's trying to protect us against some sort of interest rate risk. This is what? This is currency risk. And so we entered a contract to sell 30,000 euros at the current exchange rate. So we protect ourselves if uh, things don't move against us later, which pretty much 70, well, 73% of us got that right. Okay, so it takes a little time, guys, to kind of get some of this stuff down. There's some weightlifting that uh, goes in 
to that, but I think you've got the information here to allow you to kind of get through these last two modules and keep, keep caught up with uh, chapter one. Now, we've got some time. We've got a good chunk of time that's left. And, um, you know, the natural flow of things would be to jump into um, the start of chapter two. But I don't want to get into the discussion of the capital asset pricing model because I think we're kind of like having a lot of uh, information that's here. So I think what would be better is for us to jump to module four. Well, we've got a choice. We can jump to module four in chapter two, or we can go ahead and call it an evening, and then we'll just pick up chapter two next time. It's really kind of up to you, but I don't want to start with module one because I think that's a little too meaty for this time of the end of the uh, end of the class. So what do you think? Module four, chapter two, or you want to you want to go to jail or you want to go home? Go home. I kind of want to go to jail. <laughs> OK. I'm well, OK continuing. OK. All right, good. Well, let's do that and I, let's go ahead then. And let's open up uh, chapter two. And um, what I'm gonna do here is do it in this context, okay? So that we kind of feel that we're getting some value added here since we have a little extra time. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the chapter four material, but also in the context of uh, what if I got an essay question that was asking me some of this stuff? Uh, how would I kind of go about making sure I'm covering the points needed for the essay? Since um, we've got a little extra time, we don't typically get a chance for me to coach you up a little bit on how to do task-based simulation, particularly the essay. Okay, so let's do it that way. I'm going to go to chapter two, and I think I want to find chapter uh, should be page 29 of the PDF. Thank you. Got it. Okay. And let's talk about inventory management. And let's talk about um, the lower up cost or market or net realizable value. Now, if you are studying for or have taken far, you're probably pretty familiar with this. So that's good. You've got some you know, exposure to this stuff. And so uh, I think it's a good thing for us to look at this tonight. And if you've taken intermediate accounting, which you have, if you're in this class, you've had some exposure to this. So let's take a look at this. Say, so we say when the value of inventory falls below its original cost, the inventory must be restated at the lower of uh, market value or net realizable value. Okay, below the cost or the market value or net realizable value. Inventory costed using LIFO or the retail method is measured at the low cost or market. All other methods will use the lower of cost or net realizable value. So flashcard that so you know when you would use the lower of cost or net realizable value for all other methods or whether when you would use the lower of cost or market, which is for the LIFO uh, or the uh, retail inventory method, okay? Now, how do you define market value, okay? And they tell us here that market value is the item's replacement cost, okay? As long as it does not exceed the ceiling or does not go below the floor. Thus, what they're telling us here, it is the median or middle amount between the market ceiling and the market floor. Now, where you would run into trouble on the exam is if you didn't know the definition as to how to cal calculate ceiling and floor. The problem will give you replacement costs. The problem will tell you, this is the replacement cost. This is what it would cost if you had to go into the open market and replace this inventory item. Market ceiling, is the net realizable selling price less the cost to complete and dispose of the inventory? Flashcard that. 
the market floor is basically the net realizable value that we just calculated, okay, less a normal profit margin, okay? So net realizable value is essentially what the market ceiling, okay? So you could flashcard that. So flashcard the definition of net realizable value, which is essentially the market ceiling, and flashcard how you calculate the market ceiling, and then flashcard how you calculate the market floor. Now, when you have those memorized and you start looking at problems, saying it's like this is giving you an example, if you have those definitions memorized, it's a piece of cake. If you don't have the definitions memorized, then you're going to start to run into some problems, okay? So they tell me here at the very beginning that they purchased this inventory for $55, okay? Well, when I see that, I'm going to write down that $55 because I want to see is the market less. If the market is less, then I'm going to have to report that market. If what? Well, if the cost, if the market is higher, then I'm going to use the cost, okay? Now I come over and they tell me that the current replacement cost is $48. So I would go ahead and I would write down RC replacement cost. I put that off to the side because I want to evaluate it to make sure that it's not over the mark, over the ceiling. It's not below the floor. Okay. Now what happens? I come up with this market ceiling. And when I come up with the market ceiling, it is uh, this 50. Uh, one dollars which they tell me is the net realizable value up here and so the market ceiling is 51 because net realizable value is 51. then they come over and they tell me that the normal profit is what is five so i have to calculate the floor the floor is what 46 which is the 51 minus that normal profit so now I'm looking at replacement cost and replacement cost is what? It is not, the ceiling is what? The ceiling is 51. The floor is what? 46. So it's not below the floor. It's not above the ceiling. And so it is thus the middle amount. So my market is 48. And since my market is 48, I will report that at the lower of cost or market, the market being 48, I'll report that at 48. Now under FIFO, I would use what? The lower of the cost or net realizable value, right? And so for that now, because all other inventories other than, um, other than LIFO and retail use the net realizable value. So I would report it at 51. Okay, now you come over and um, let's take a look now at cost flow assumptions, okay? And this is where I could see the examiners asking you an advantage, disadvantage essay question. And they could ask you, what are the advantages to using FIFO versus LIFO? Let's say they ask you that, okay? How many elements do you think you're answering there? If they ask you advantages, disadvantages between FIFO and LIFO, do you have two things that you're answering there? Four. Good. Very good. You've got four things that you're going to answer. So you would go through and you would structure your answer in a way that addresses what? Advantage of FIFO, disadvantage of FIFO, advantage of LIFO, disadvantage of LIFO. Good, okay? Because it's easy to get involved in writing an essay and then you kind of start answering and then you forget, oh, wait, I was supposed to talk about advantage, disadvantage of the two, okay? Okay, good. So you start to look and they start to tell us about first in, first out, okay? And Ending inventory on the balance sheet includes the most recently incurred cost and therefore approximates replacement costs. What do you think? Advantage or disadvantage of FIFO? Advantage. Good. Advantage. Because the what? The 
um, balance sheet is pretty much showing what it would cost us to replace the inventory because in a first in first out, we're taking a cost to get sold those things that we bought a long time ago, right? Okay. Now, um, under FIFO, the first cost inventory or the first cost transferred to the cost of goods sold, even if I bought those things three years ago, okay, or during inflationary time, right? Okay. That's another thing that you can put in there you, you, during inflationary times. Okay. So these are advantages, disadvantages, what? During periods of inflation. Okay. Which we're currently in, right? Okay, during periods of inflation. So, do you think the first cost inventory or the first cost transfer, the cost to get sold, is an advantage or disadvantage of FIFO? Advantage because it makes your um, gross profit higher. Well, uh, I would say. Michael, that that it that is a disadvantage. Remember, we're CPAs, so we're looking at it from the standpoint of what, how is it going to inform the decisions of users of financial reports, and that's a disadvantage to them because net income is essentially overstated, isn't it? Okay, so you're looking at it from the standpoint of the company. I'm looking at it from the standpoint of capital markets and the information that they're using to make investment and credit decisions. And so that's what, that's a disadvantage because I'm putting lower cost items during period of inflation to my cost of goods sold. So my cost of goods sold is what? Understated. And so my what? My net income is going to be uh, overstated. Okay, the other way, that you could talk about it is what FIFO is good for the balance sheet, but it is bad for the income statement, isn't it? Okay. So we actually got what? We actually got a pretty good little thing. We talk about advantage, disadvantages. We talk about the effect on the balance sheet, the income statement, okay? This is how you wanna write these questions. You wanna think through what are the elements I have to cover and what are the good points in support of my argument. Now, let's say you got this whole thing twisted. You got it backwards. If you give a wrong answer, use good grammar when you give that wrong answer because you get points even if you put down the wrong thing you get points for what for what you put down correctly i mean for what you put down in good grammar you get points for using good grammar so even if you sit there and you mess up the answer you'll still get points for your grammar okay okay good now let's come over and let's talk about last in first out okay and under inventory, the last cost inventory, the first cost transferred to cost of goods sold. Um, the let's start with the ending balance typically does not approximate replacement cost because inventory includes what the older items. Is that a advantage or disadvantage? Disadvantage. Good. How about under LIFO, last cost inventory, the first cost transfer to cost of goods sold? That would be an advantage. That's an advantage because now my cost of goods sold is pretty much showing me what it's currently costing me to acquire these inventory items, right? Okay, so that's an advantage of LIFO. How about net income? Net income should be lower because your cog should be higher. Net income is lower, which is good. And it should be lower because I'm better matching what? My current sales to my current costs, right? Okay. So if that's so that's really kind of an advantage. So again, to use our little face thing here for the balance sheet, LIFO is what? I'm trying to draw the face here. Bad. For the income statement, 
again, looking at it from the standpoint of the information for investors and creditors, it's good. Okay. All right. So that gives you a sense there of what you would do uh, when you're looking at a question and you're trying to, you know, get into an essay type of a thing, how you would address that. And what I would do is when you're working with your essays and your task-based simulation homework and stuff, get in the habit of jotting down a few notes of what it is you want to cover and write your discussion from that outline. Okay, just jot down a few notes for your outline to keep yourself organized. When you look at the Becker solutions, don't panic. Becker writes the solutions that you look at in questions to cover, you know, 150% of what might be points might be given for you only need what you only want to get a 75 on those task based simulation if even that. And so you could miss half the points available in that and still do an excellent job to pass the task-based simulation, survive the task-based simulation and be in good shape on your exam. Okay, now, uh, since we're in this module and we still have some time, why don't we go ahead and um, finish up this uh, module that we're in right now, that was module two, okay? So let's look at factors that will affect inventory, okay? And so inventory depends on the accuracy of sales forecast. Lack of inventory can result in lost sales. Excessive inventory can result in uh, burdensome uh, carrying costs, including storage, insurance, opportunity costs, uh, of inventory investment, lost inventory due to obsolescence, or spoilage, theft. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, uh, you can also call that shrinkage. Okay. All right, good. So go ahead and flashcard those factors, including what the lost sale component up here if you have uh, too little inventory. Okay, people walk in, they want something, and this happens to me all the time. I walk in, I want to buy something, and they never have what I want. Okay, it's always, well, we can sell you the computer, but it's the one with the less storage. We can buy you the cell phone, but we don't have the most current one. This is like, not so well. Why would I buy something that's already been surpassed in terms of technology? Okay, now you come back. And you take a look at um, reorder point, okay? And let's just look at reorder point. The reorder point is the inventory level at which the company should order or manufacture additional inventory. The reorder point can be calculated using the following formula. And we have what? We have a certain amount of safety stock. In other words, we don't want our shelves to go empty plus lead time times sales during the lead time. So however long it's going to take you, because you're going to never want to go out of stock, but then you want to meet the current uh, sales that are, are going to be uh, completed while you're waiting for this stuff to uh, come in. So let's just look at this example. Uh, worldwide widgets sells 8,000 widgets per year, manufactures widgets in groups of 1,500, and requires five-week lead time uh, for widget production. Worldwide also maintains an absolute minimum safety stock of 1,200. Okay, so we know we've got 1,200, and we're going to assume a 50-week year here. I don't know why we're assuming a 50-week year, but worldwide sells an average of 160 widgets per week, 8,000 widgets per year divided by 50 weeks. And so we have what? We have a five week lead time. We have what? 160 widgets per week that we sell. So doing the math, we have to reorder additional widgets when the inventory level sells to 2,000. That way we maintain our safety stock. And while we're waiting to produce more units, we can meet our sales needs. Okay. Now, what you can do is you can turn that same sort of uh, 
consideration and you can actually use calculus to figure out what the uh, most optimal time is to order inventory okay and so what you would do is you would minimize a formula here to the basically when that's that whole reorder point and you would do some calculus on that to create this formula down here and why don't you just go ahead and flashcard the uh, order size annual sales and units cost per purchase order annual carrying cost per unit and basically you do some cat somebody did some calculus on that to come up with this formula you don't have to do the calculus you have to know this formula which is the economic order point equals the square root of two times the sales times the cost per order divided by the carrying cost per order and you can see the way that formula is applied down there guys i don't have to read that through you it's just a matter of plugging the numbers in okay good um coming over then uh let's take a look at um accounts payable management a little bit okay and um when we look at accounts payable management coming over here um we have to be aware that if we fail to take a discount there is a cost to that okay and so um the annual percentage rate associated with failing to take a, a payment discount um is you know when you pay in a shorter period of time is given to us by this formula and so you can see that we have this uh 360 day year we often assume on the exam 30 day is the period that um, we're supposed to pay they give us a discount we pay 10 uh, percent the terms are what 110 net 30 and then we go ahead and uh, follow the formula and so the cost is 18.2 percent okay so when you come and you look at some of these questions you'll see some like this one okay and the best way to um, do this question is just simply use the formula to answer it and I'm not going to go we're not going to go through this one together you can just use the formula for that and then um, let's look at question two together and then we'll go ahead and adjourn for the evening you'll be through module two uh, what is it module four excuse me chapter two Okay, looks like most of us have had a chance and looks like everybody nailed this one. Uh, we're 100% there. And yeah, uh, an increase in which of the following cost management to reduce the average inventory, um, it's going to be what the cost of uh, uh, carrying the inventory is going to want you to reduce the amount of inventory that you carry. The cost of placing an order no, because you'd have to do what? Place more orders. 
and a demand for the product, there's a potential you'll lose some sales. Lead time needed to acquire inventory, uh, if that increases, you're going to want to carry more safety stuff, so probably, right? Okay, good. Uh, I think that's pretty good. We're going to still get out a little bit early, but I think that's all right. Um, what you should be doing is completing chapter one, taking a look at uh, module five here that we just covered. Is that what oh, module four, excuse me, that we just, what did we just cover? Module four, right? Yeah, module four. yeah look at module four uh, from chapter two, and then we'll pick up with uh, module one going back and talking about the capital asset pricing model and whatnot and continuing on through chapter two next time. Any question? Okay, guys, we will see you next week. Make sure you're keeping up with your homework. I will be looking at that here pretty quickly, okay? Thank you. Have Thank a good you. night. Have Thank a good you. Night. Have a good night. Thanks, Professor. Thank night. you.